Welcome to E3. I thank God for His grace that's evident in your lives. And I speak very often with uh, Pastor Sass. We go way back, way back like teenagers. So um, we speak often and, you know, it's been, it's been a joy hearing about the great things that God is doing here. Uh, and I can see, and I know there's so much more that God is doing in our lives and in our midst. And I do not take it lightly that um, at the start of this wonderful anniversary celebration that he's asked me to come and share with you. Uh, it's not, you know, I do not take it lightly anywhere because I am a pastor too, and it's not, it's not easy to give uh, your pulpit, you know, uh, God's pulpit, to someone else because <laughs> sometimes you're not sure what they're going to say. Um, yes, <laughs> we, we know. We know how those things are. But I thank God. I, have, I was really holding myself, mommy, from coming to come and give you a hug. Well, I'm going to give you a hug later, ma. Please, please, ma. I honor you. I thank you, ma, uh, for all the prayers and all the things that uh, you have been doing for us, all of us. Because our mothers, they pray for us then. Yes, um, we were crazy. Anyway, <laughs> Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your strength. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your might. We thank you because even before we arrived here, you were already here. And we know that your word has started rolling out from the first thing that was done in this meeting today. And I thank you, O God, for the ministration of your power and of your spirit has already been at work and will continue, O God. For we know you are here to heal, to bless, to save, to deliver, to uplift, to encourage, to bring peace, to bring comfort. To bring a strengthening of mind, soul, and body to everyone here and even for those who may be watching online. We give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Psalm 18, verse 35 to 36. If you can help me in the NLT. Psalm 18, verse 35 to 36 in the NLT. Do you have Good News Translation? Yeah, I'm sure they do. But put this in the NLT. Psalm 18, verse 35 to 36. It says, you have given me your shield of victory. Your right hand supports me. Your help has made me great. 36, and we'll come back to 35. It says, you have made a wide path for my feet to keep them from slipping. Go back to verse 35, and we're going to read that together. Verse 35. Once you go. Okay, some people don't speak English yet. I need you to say it as people who know what they're saying. Once you go. Your right hand has helped me. Your help has made me great. Somebody say hallelujah. Amen. God has given us his shield of victory. His right hand supports us and his help has made us great. God has designed us to succeed. He's equipped us to succeed. And everything you see in that scripture is true. It is truer, it is more, more real than the breath from your nostril. It is not your uncle who is a commissioner, your brother who has money, your auntie who is a businesswoman in the United Kingdom or in the U.S., or that your cousin that traveled to Spain five years ago who has been promising you he's going to help you. He says God's help is what makes you great. Not man's thoughts, not man's help, but God's help. It, because it's really, really important that your appearance upon the face of the earth is not by accident. Those scriptures were written before you were born. 
your existence in life is not by chance. The fact that you're here today is an orchestration of God's work in your life. And that everything you need to achieve in life that has been written of you in God's books, God has designed you, God has equipped you to achieve every single one of them. Thank you, Pastor Sass, for mentioning about purpose and what we've been hearing this weekend. Because... Our purpose is not tied to the length of days upon the face of the earth, but our purpose, our success in life is tied to the purpose that God has for you. You know, the world defines success by so many different things. You know, the color of your bank account, whether it's black, red, or green. The color of the car you wear, where you live, who you were born, yeah, who your parents are, who your uncle is, or who your auntie is, or where you schooled, where you didn't school. And in some parts of the world, even the color of your skin. The world defines success by so many different things. And even we have, ex- we have extrapolated and extended the definition of success in the world to our lives as believers. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Because in it, you will find what? Goodness. You will meditate upon it. Thank you. It says, uh, um, uh, yeah, that's fine. It says this book of instruction, you know, study this book, book of instruction continually, meditate on it day and night, and be sure to do everything that's written in it. Only then, only then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. Let's read verse 9. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The discovery of God's purpose and of the success that God has for you is tied to his word. It's tied to his word. It's in his word. I thank God for the testimonies, you know, and I know my brother, uh, his, his uh, messages can be strong. I thank God that there are young people here, many young people. <laughs> I don't know how you guys, you know, but God is helping you. <laughs> he didn't start today. <laughs> we know him. I thank God that the Holy Spirit is interpreting it for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Clarity of purpose can only be discovered in God's word. The more you hear, the more you understand, the more you read, the more you meditate, the more, you know, a lot of times when you read God's word, it may not make sense. It's okay. How many of us, when we were in school, oh, I'm going to some of us in you know, school, sorry. How many of us, when we were in primary school, everything you were taught made sense? If you were so smart, then I wasn't. You can put up your hand. But I'm sure many of us today would appreciate and look back and say, wow, thank God I listened to my parents and did my homework. And I learned those things. Because now it makes sense. Tell the person beside you, it may not make sense now. But keep on. Keep studying. Keep reading. Keep meditating. It will make sense very soon. I'll tell us a little story from the book of Exodus. Exodus, let's, uh, Exodus chapter 3, if you have it in the Good News uh, translation, we'll read a re- uh, little story rather. Equipped by God to succeed. Uh, we'll read from verse 1 to 6, that's fine. Uh, Exodus chapter 3. It says, one day while Moses was taking care of the sheep and goats of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, he led the flock across the desert and came to Sinai, the holy mountain. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him as a flame coming from the middle of a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it was not burning up. This is strange, he thought. Why is it the bush burning? I will go closer and see. 
when the Lord saw that Moses was coming closer, he called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He answered, yes, here I am. God said, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Moses covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. You know, God's design for us to succeed is not an event, but it's a process. A lot of times we are looking for events. We are looking for the program to attend for the breakthrough. God's breakthrough for you is not an event. It's a process. The Bible says of Jesus that he lent obedience by the things he suffered. Look at the process of him dying on the cross. It wasn't something that humbled in a second, in a minute. It took several days. The walk of salvation was a process of time. Jesus was born. He lived. He died. He rose again. You know, some of us forget so many different things because between when he was born and when he appeared 33, in, uh, you know, 30, 33 years or you know, 30 years and began the ministry, what do you think was happening then? Have you ever thought about it? He was a young loon, like they say in Scotland, running around the place on diapers, on pampers. He had to be changed. You know, some of us, we don't think about those things. The angels were not magically appearing every morning and wiping him down and giving him a bath. The process, and God takes us through that process. And we all have plans during that process, don't we? We have ideas and we have different things. But remember that whatever plan it is you have has to be subject to God's purpose. Proverbs 19 verse 1, the message version says, We humans keep brainstorming options and plans, but God's purpose is what prevails. Moses had a plan for that day. Moses had a plan. I will take the sheep I will lead them out and I will get them fed and watered and come back home. And something happened on the way. I'll share with us about three or four points depending on how time would allow. And the first one is that how flexible are your plans to God's purpose? How many people here have a plan for today? It's not unspiritual to have a plan. So if you have a plan, please rope it. <laughs> I have a plan. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with having a plan. You should have a plan. If you don't have a plan, we need to pray for you now. You should have a plan. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with having a plan. Even Jesus said, he who wants to build a tower should first sit down and consider, have a plan. There's nothing wrong with having a plan. The problem is that when your plans are not flexible to God's purpose, that's where the, pro that's where the problem is. Moses had a plan for that day. Then he saw the burning bush. And the Bible says that he saw the bush and he saw that it was a strange thing. And he said, I will go closer and have a look. He changed his plan when he had an inclination of something different that God was doing. How flexible are your plans to God's purpose? Verse 3. This is a strange thing, he thought. Why isn't the bush burning? I will go closer and... See, how many of us have ever been in a wonderful church meeting, worship? Oh, please put your hands together for the worship team, amplified everyone here. It's been fantastic. 
I want uh, Pastor Sass, I'm getting a new private jet. Yes, everyone. We can leave you here to share the word. It's okay. <laughs> we need to export all of you to Aberdeen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful time. Amen. I couldn't have been anywhere else today but here. Well, apart from Lovebridge, yes. <laughs> And, you know, you're in the middle of a worship meeting like that, and everybody's, you know, having worship. And you see some people bring out their mobile phones. They are live streaming. They are taking pictures. Oh, it's wonderful being here. I bet Mo if Moses had a mobile phone, he would have been tempted. Burning bush, I better put this on IG. <laughs> TikTok. Facebook. I need more likes. Somebody say, yeah, there. <laughs> I need more followers. And we're snapping and we're, we're doing all that. Moses said, I will go by myself. The songwriter says, draw me close to you. Never let me go. I think there's a missing link there because a lot of times God wants us to be the ones that want to draw closer. Have that desire. What attracts you? What attracts you? Are you attracted to God's presence? Are you attracted to his word? Or are you looking for the next best thing on social media to hook on to? I try not to do Facebook a lot. Because once you start, once you say, oh, ah, they send you a notification on your email, your friend has shared something. Once you go in there, the algorithm is super, fantastic. They lead you down the road and you will end up watching something or seeing something two hours later that you did not start with. Papa Idaosa said, whatever takes your attention gives you direction in life. What attracts you? Are you attracted to God's presence? Are you attracted to his person? Are you attracted to building a relationship with him? Are you attracted to his word? Moses said, I will go closer and see. He was attracted to God's presence. That's my second point. What attracts you? Because it's in this process that we see God equipping us, designing us to succeed. Because we all know this story, don't we? That was the real beginning of the achievement of God's purpose in Moses' life. What would have happened if he didn't go closer? What would have happened if he wasn't attracted? What would have happened if all he did was burning bush? Google, what should I do? Parents of these days, including myself, were terrible. You know, they used to say parents know everything. And nowadays, when your kids ask you a question, uh, you try to, as they're talking, you're like trying to Google it. <laughs> you cannot hear from God when he is not an attraction to you. You cannot hear from God when he is not Everything about him is not an attraction to you. My beautiful wife, I'm attracted to her. It's happening. Yeah. I can't say, if I say from the first day now, I'll be called into CFI Inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> her voice is distinct to me. Okay, Father Lord, we're in church. <laughs> Point number three. <laughs> Point number three. <laughs> Please help me with point number three. <laughs> Do you know God's voice? Do you know God's voice? I'm going to stop in point number four. Do you know God's voice? Because we see in verse four... 
God calls out to Moses, when he saw that Moses was coming closer, ah, when God saw that Moses had a desire to grow in his relationship with him, the Bible says, God called to him from the middle of the burning bush, Moses, Moses, and he answered, yes, here I am. Moses recognized, understood God's voice. This is really interesting because I'm just thinking in our days, again, back to Google, burning bush with a voice, what do I say? And Google will spit out an answer. You can try it now. What kind of relationship do you have with God? I always tell people everywhere I've had the opportunity to lead, pastor, whatever. Don't expect, don't expect me to tell you what God wants to tell you. Yes, there will be some times, yes, God would speak specifically to me. But you need to know God for yourself. Because when the rubber hits the road, it is that relationship that will keep you. The church is like a petrol station. You come to fill up. How many of you have ever seen somebody go to the petrol station, fill up his tank, and park his car there and say, I have arrived? You fill up and you go on the road of life. Filled and filled by God. You need to have a personal relationship with him such that when he calls you, you know who he is. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They what know me and they follow me. Oh, John said some, uh, sorry, Jesus said something very hard in John 8, 47. I'm not going to paraphrase it or requote it. Please put it up on the screen, John 8, 47. He who comes from God listens to God's words. Jesus was talking to the, to the Pharisees or whoever they were. You, however, are not from God, and that is why you will not listen. Can you put this in uh, King James, actually? Or NLT? NLT, please, sorry. It says, anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you do not belong to God. Anyone who belongs to him, no matter how hard the word may be, they listen. They hear, they understand, and they follow. Moses said when he heard the voice of God, it resonated in his heart. It resonated to the depths of his being. He did not need a prophet to interpret what was happening for him. He did not need a soothsayer or whoever. He did not need the prayer band to interpret the situation for him. He said, Lord, here I am. He responded to God because he had a relationship with him. Ask the person beside you, how is your relationship? Some people's mind may eventually go to that person, relationship. How is your relationship with God? How is it? He wasn't scared about God's voice. <laughs> That's another thing to take out of that. He was not scared. 
we're joking. Um, um, you know, um, some of us who grew who grew up with parents uh, or who had parents rather from you know uh, older generation, and we're just joking about you know the how you know how we would hear our dads come in after after the day's work, and he horn at the gate, pam pam, or the sound of the of his car, and everybody runs like ah, you take off. For those of us who have kids now, <laughs> we know what happens when you're getting home. He has to come out and hug you and all that. But, you know, that, that, that relationship is different. Not that our parents didn't love us. It was how they knew how to do what they did. And when, they hear, when you hear the sound of your father's voice then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> several things can be there. And even now, you know, with our kids and how they've grown up with us, when they hear your voice, they know it's you. They know it's their parents. They know it's their father. They know it's their mother. When you hear God's voice, do you really recognize it? You learn God's voice in the place of his word, in the place of prayers, in the place of worship, in having fellowship with him. Last point, verse 6. Sorry, verse 5 and verse 6. Verse 5 and verse 6. God said, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing, the ground you're standing on is holy ground. Verse 6. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Moses covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. You can put up the point. It's point number four. Yo, God. Somebody say, yo, God. I've lived in the UK for uh, a few years, and a wonderful, lovely country. Um, I'll tell us a few things about the Queen of England. There are some things that are forbidden in the presence of the Queen of England. One of those is, you do not show up to have a meet, well, you can only be invited to go meet with her, except you accidentally meet her, um, which does happen. Uh, but you do not go, when you are invited to meet with her, you do not go with an empty hand. You come with a gift. And in her presence, you stand at attention. You do not touch her. You do not call her by her first name. You only speak when she speaks to you. And if you happen to be in a place where you, you, have, where you have been invited for tea or for lunch or dinner or whatever the name may be, you cannot start eating until she has started eating. And when she stops eating, you have to stop eating. So for those of you that may have been fantasizing or dreaming about going to have lunch or dinner with her, you'll be disappointed. <laughs> and this is just uh, one of the things, I've, a few of the things I've picked up from a long list of different things that are mandatory in the presence of the Queen of England. A human being who has a defined lifespan, a defined scope, rich influence, on the earth, one human being. And our Father and God is the maker of heaven and earth. The one who sits in the circle of lights, because heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. The one who breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of man. The creator that was not created. Our Jehovah El Shaddai. The God who is more than enough. The one who said, the cattle on the thousand hills are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The gold and the silver in the earth is mine. Who is man <laughs> that I am mindful of him? Our mighty God in battle. And yet, by our actions, we disrespect him. 
by the thoughts of our hearts. We honor human monarchs and, you know, whatever their names are, political figures, whatever, much more than we honor him. The Bible says of Moses, as he approached, God said, show honor and reverence for my presence. And Moses bowed down his head in honor and reverence to God. I see us, not us here, but in the Christian faith, we dishonor God in so many ways. Even in the physical, you know, demonstration of his presence in church. If the Queen of England was here, I bet, you know, many of us would have to do so many things differently. If the governor was here, the local government chairman was here. And a lot of times, when you look at what we do as believers for those people, and we compare it with what we do, in honor and in reverence to God, we will be shocked. He's our loving father, and he wants to cuddle with you, and he wants to embrace you, and he wants to love you to the utmost. But he also needs us to reverence him. I'll read one last scripture, and that's it. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 to 14. Do you have the ERV version? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 to 14. I think I've gone over my time. I'm sorry. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God, obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. Verse 14. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether it be good or bad. Let's go back to 13. The whole story, final conclusion. Fear God. Honor him, reverence him. That's the whole duty of man. Yo, God, some of us treat him and everything that concerns him as if he's our pal next door without respect. You can love someone and respect them. You can love someone deeply. You can have a deep relationship with someone. And reverence them. Moses bowed down his head in honor and reverence. When you honor and reverence those that God has set in your midst, in your life, you are honoring and you're respecting God. Let's bow down our heads as we pray. Grace isn't just a prayer you chant before taking a meal, it's the way we live. The Lord came to show me how crooked I am, but Grace came to straighten me out. Hello, I'm Ostato Barry Siagon, the senior pastor of House of Grace Benin, and I'm of Church of God Mission. Here, we liberate people from the bondage of religion through the gospel of grace that we teach, encouraging them to be all that God has called them to be. House of Grace is a dynamic worship center where lives are transformed in an atmosphere of love, friendship, and humility. We have seen troubled marriages restored. We have seen miracle babies to couples who are waiting on the Lord for children, birth of new businesses, and an undying passion to reach out to the unsaved for Jesus Christ. Come fellowship with us today and let Jesus make a difference in your life.